All right. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the North Carolina Museum of Art. My name is Ali Wagner. I'm the manager of studio programs. Um, and today's guest will be Fab Bianchi. Um, I'd ask that all of you guys uh, go ahead and keep your cameras turned off. Uh, we had to run this as a meeting as opposed to um, as opposed to a webinar. Um, so basically, this will let you do whatever you want. Um, <clears throat> So with that said, yeah, please turn your cameras off and remain muted. Uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, it would be easiest if you just type them in the chat uh, and I can moderate on uh, your behalf and just ask Fab for you. Uh, but if you do want to ask him some questions, I'm going to open it up for Q&A at the end. So everyone can uh, also just hold your questions till then. Uh, unless, of course, it's about something he's doing in the moment, in which case, fire away. Um, all right. So... Uh, Oh, real quick before we get going, um, those of you who don't know, Fab's been a Triangle Area artist I, for as long as I've been a Triangle Area artist, for, so for a while, um, I've known Fab forever. Um, Fab recently has uh, work, or he has work right now, I believe in, where, Frank and Carborough and eight or C3 in Hillsboro, uh, and then Fab's got some upcoming shows here in the area, uh, Carborough Art Center and at Sertoma Art Center. Uh, I believe that will be at Cabro Art Center, uh, August 26th. Um, am I right on that? Okay, cool. Um, yeah. All right. Um, and as usual, this is going to be recorded. Uh, and so I will uh, have this sent out to everyone and post it on our YouTube channel probably in about a week from now. So if there's anything you guys missed or you want to uh, share this with anyone, feel free to do that um, and you can come back to it again. Um, all right. Uh, are you ready to go, Fab? I am. All right. Let me uh, let me let you take the way here. All right. Thanks, Ali, and thanks everyone for joining. Um, I wanted to start with a PowerPoint that um, would be able to. Well, hopefully, I can get this to work. Uh, just a, a little preview of what you can uh, expect. During the talk, I have been a, an artist pretty much all my life. Over 30 years of that has been painting, but I wanted to focus mostly on um, ever since graduate studies, which is about a 20 year uh, time span. As far as being a third generation artist, it started with my great grandfather, then my father, then myself. Uh, living in Durham currently, my family's from Argentina, and have visited uh, frequently growing up, which has helped with the series that I'm working on currently. And there's been a variety of different styles, cubism, futurism, graffiti, abstract expressionism. Uh, the influences have been the Chilean surrealist, Roberto Mata a couple Italian futurists, Umberto Boccioni, Giacomo Bala, an Argentine artist uh, in abstract, Emilio Petoruti, and Mark Bradford from Los Angeles. I've shown in a, quite a few places, including the Museum of Art, the Cam in Raleigh, Diamante, Uno Arts Mill, the Frank Gallery, as Ali mentioned, C3, which is a newish gallery in Hillsboro, and a few others. And so I have fine arts degrees in painting from ECU and University of New Mexico. Working full time as an, a graphic designer and then a painter and art instructor on nights and weekends. A lot to juggle, but I'm able to make it happen. I can try to, there we go. So the themes that I've been covering in the past and most recently have been about my memory and identity of dual cultures, redefining myself over time as those memories fade. And so it plays a part in how the Latino identity is relative over time. So with the series that I'm going to show you after this presentation, is where I'm using the same repetitive motions. 
either within one composition or in a series in each composition. And the latest series is using these motions and it's all procedural. I'm using very similar shapes and layout. And it starts, it's a series of sticks that will actually be shown at the art center. It starts very vibrant and opaque and eventually works its way into an, a monochromatic ambiguity. It's black and white and it starts to lose its structural essence. And as the memories fade, so do the connections to my Argentine roots, which I reflect in the series. And so I've been lately exploring different techniques, especially with wood, wood burning with a tool and scorching with a propane torch and then using acrylics and inks uh, afterwards superficially. So starting with the graduate studies, this was the first painting where I was exploring a portrait as more part of a facade using a Trump Loyal effect of, of old and worn signage plus a, a written note that I was mimicking on the right side. And so all this was collaged together and you can even see the exposed wooden frame on the left. And just trying to show this deterioration of the Spanish cowboy, the Argentine cowboy. And this would resonate with a few pieces 20 years ago and present day. And these are done in acrylics. Another one that was about six feet by six feet and wanted to create more of a requiem of this persona of the gaucho in a larger scale deteriorating over time and having uh, branding coca-cola in a way this is a self-portrait where it spells out m-e on the left but it is part of the brand of quilmes which is a beer brand from argentina and then a cabaret ad for the head over a cartoon body from an Argentine artist. This collaging of different cultural icons and elements would resonate uh, a couple years later after graduate studies. And this is more of a playful collaging of, of different elements and trying to make them work. The laughing cow, robots, signage, you name it, giving it color, giving it texture. And these themes or recurring elements would resonate in something a little bit later, ten, about 10 years ago, of a series called Paintagonia, Paint Paragonia. So there was a lot of hybridization of words or titles that I would come up with such as the one on the left, tobacco, asado, barbecue in Spanish, tobacco asado. And so there was this hybrid of the, the cowboy and gaucho, even using Lucky Luke, which is a Canadian cowboy cartoon on the lower left. And then graffiti, collage, uh, you name it. The same with the one on the right, and this play of cartoon violence, but also this clashing. You see Pepsi and Coca-Cola silhouetted as bulls up at the top, the bull fight, and all these really angular and uh, textured shapes. And the angular shapes would be part of what I've done recently or currently. So we fast forward to a couple of years ago, where I was starting to really dive into total abstraction and using very um, playful brush marks that I was fascinated during my trips to Argentina 
of a style of brushwork called fileteado. It's very calligraphic and it was used to create signage painted in or on street signs or um, horse drawn carts and very colorful and vibrant um, sales and you know, giving a menu of, let's say a food cart. And I wanted to try that. And in multiple compositions would use this approach of these curvilinear strokes repeatedly over and over again, over layers of larger fields of color to where it would become a little bit more abstract and cubistic. And this was uh, also a couple of years ago. And so more of the second in succession. It would start off where a lot of marks are made and then shapes and forms would appear and I would start to solidify them and then recede areas around those shapes or push them forward depending. Afterwards, it's more of an exploration. This was a smaller work series from last year. And these would become maquettes, if you will, of larger pieces. So these are about eight by eight inch squared formats. And it was just trying to play around with some color and form. So what you see in the, the top of uh, the center of the top row and the far upper right, you will see on the left, wandering light. Again, all these are acrylics for the most part using drips and texture and color, and then having something a little bit more, a mix between cubism and futurism with the piece on the right. And the, the maquette you saw on the upper right was translated into this painting on the left. And someone was inspired to approach me to uh, ask for a commission with the one on the right, the Alpen Glow. So more colorful, but it would mimic what is found out in Colorado uh, during sunset or sunrise. On the left though, that was inspired by mountain ranges in Argentina that would have layers of sediment that would create different colors. And so it's called the 14 color mountain. And so I named this 14 color stall. So now we fast forward to the, the beginning of this year. And this was part of a Latinx group show. These are stages of the same painting. And what's been great about working with certain series like these is that you could basically create new variations from each of these paintings and could very much happen, especially with the one on the far left. Sometimes you feel driven to keep working on the same painting and you can't help but just keep refining and it becomes it's a completely different composition and that's fine. I'm able to at least document the progress with a lot of these paintings and then circle back to see if, well, maybe I can go back a couple forks in the road and take another path. These angular compositions textured with maybe pools of liquid paint would exist or the one on the far right where it would would drip. All these have been shown at the Frank Gallery. The middle one is still currently on display. So now we go to the Latin X group show that was at Diamante earlier this year. And that's where I was really getting into wooden boards for compositions. 
And it eventually started as vertical pieces. These would have a representation very loosely of Argentina. You can't really see it yet. And I will trace it when we look at the work after the presentation, but you will see the, the outline of Argentina twice on each composition. The idea here was that as you have a memory that just happened, it goes through a cycle. With something very recent, it's very vivid, it's very opaque, just like you see on the left. And then the second one starts to dissipate in terms of its details with the memory, where I was using acrylic inks and was able to use washes. So you see a lot of transparency to where we start to see just the basic details burned in literally with either a blowtorch or a wood burning tool, which I will show you uh, during the demo. And then the far right, which was using homemade charcoal that was crushed and then water added to create these solutions then brushed onto the camera or onto the board. But it may, had me thinking, these look a little more interesting to abstract the shape of Argentina even further, where we see horizontal compositions. And it creates almost a completely different composition. And in my opinion, something a little more interesting. And you can see the progression here from the upper left start all the way to the lower right finish, if you will. So those are some of the pieces that I've worked on. And as Ali mentioned, currently a piece of the Frank Gallery, the P3 Gallery in Hillsboro. Later this month, there will be a grand opening, but also a talk on September 8th during Second Friday, and then a couple shows in 2024. I wanted to show you some of the process. And if you're able to see the larger screen, we'll be able to look at some of the work that has been done. So I wanted to start with the material that I used for the composition. And it's basically an underlay of a tripod uh, piece of wood and about an eighth inch thick. And what hey, I did here Fab? was I crowned one side. Hey, Fab. Yes. It's really hard to tell what you're saying. Can you maybe turn your other mic on? Sure. So I wanted to show you, I mean, with these boards, you can find how there is, uh, depending on any given day, and I get these from Home Depot, where you'll have two completely different uh, wooden materials, but they're still used as um, like an underlayer, either for cabinets or flooring. And so this one is like a mix between um, cedar and poplar. And so each side can have a variety of, of results for the wood burning. And so I can show you real quick the difference between the two. This is more compressed and a little harder of a surface. So as you burn, it creates these scorch marks, like very similar to drawing. And the way that you have pressure added to a surface, let's say with graphite and charcoal, here is, it could be a combination of pressure and the amount of time that you keep the tool on there. So 
I can keep this burning and it will create a deep mark. If I go very quickly, it barely burns at all, but it is leaving dots because there's just a little bit more time that is on the surface. So what I did earlier was to create these patterns. And the interest in this, while I have done more representational types of, of mark making with a wood burning tool, it has become more fascinating to use this on a more abstract level. And it can be combined with paint. So these, I have used anything from paint to acrylic inks. And so I'm gonna add just a little bit of paint over this. And depending on how opaque or transparent or watered down, that paint can be right now we're completely covering the surface but you can basically use this just like paint over a canvas and creates a great effect that can go back and forth between something scorched and on the surface. It's the same with, you know, using wood where there is no scorch marks. Um, but I like this combination that's happening. Now, there is just using a controlled heat method. But it could also be used with a blowtorch. And I'm not gonna burn the place down, but I wanted to show you the effect of using that blowtorch. Now, this technique is more commonly known as shu sugi ban. It's a Japanese wood burning technique that helps preserve the wood. It goes through a process of really scorching the surface of the wood and not just any wood, there's different kinds that have uh, more substance and obviously thicker than eight inch thick. And then it would be brushed with something similar to this. And I'm going to just do it one stroke just so I don't make it too messy here, but you can tell that it has, you know, it can create its own texture. And this is done maybe a couple different times, but then it's rinsed off and then uh, special oils would be added to help preserve it. What I have done, though, has been a combination of using the wood burning and this, um, you know, fire or wood scorching. And what's helped is to be able to create the wood burning with the tool first so that I can go back and reinforce certain edges. And I'll show some of those works here in a minute for examples. So it's a work in progress. I'm trying to see what I can do with this, um, you know, start or finish, cart before horse, which one, chicken or the egg, however you want to, to interpret that and find ways that they don't have to necessarily be rectilinear. There could be a variety of different layering of these wooden, boards. Um, paint can be added to this, which I can add real quick. What this does, it obviously makes it a little bit more gritty, but can create some interesting effects. And you can really see the play between brush marks and the texture and the grain of the wood, as well as the burning of the surface of the wood. And what I was experimenting with one of those boards was, if I can turn the spray, is letting the liquid work its way in between the pores.
and again, playing around with different techniques. And as you can see here, where there is the lines of the wood burning that I did earlier. And so then it helps define, because I mean, when you burn, it really can hide anything, especially pencil and anything uh, more shallow will not show up. Whereas with the tool, it's able to really bore down. And if I put a lot of pressure on here and paint over it, it still appears. So there's a variety of, of techniques with this that I'm still learning because in most cases, the wood burning has been used more of a traditional craft. So um, like I said, work in progress. The other great thing about this burning and fire technique has been from a reflection of the asado, the barbecue, which is huge in Argentina. It's a, one of the most important aspects of Argentine culture. And so what I wanted to do was use some of that culture and some of those memories of those barbecues using hardwood and burning it down to create my own charcoal. So what I wanted to show you was the charcoal itself that can be used multiple ways. We'll use it on this one. So it's basically just trying to, you know, sharpen it or whittle it down or finding pieces that I can either shape and then burn or find pieces that can have a tip. And it's basically the same as vine charcoal. The thing you have to keep in mind, it's pretty brittle and it could fade off with just that, a little bit of uh, pressure of smearing. But you can spray this, but what I've also done was take those little pieces of burned wood and with mortar and pestle, would grind these into smaller pieces. And the longer you grind, the more fine the particles are, okay? And this could either be you know, poured into a container or you can even use a brush. And if you wanted something a little bit more fine, you may not get a lot out of this, but as soon as you start adding water, it will create a wash. So what I've done, was get, this is a little bit more coarse of powder, but I would use this to grind it even further to something a little bit more fine. And this is basically like really fine powder. And then with different solutions, would put into a smaller container Add some water, mix with a brush. See how it, it starts to turn pasty. I'll have to keep adding water. And then brush this on. And it creates a, an ink like quality to this. The thing you have to keep in mind is that it might need a little bit more binder. So you can mix this with gel medium because it's, if it's left untreated or there's no spray, you know, with like, let's say a, a cheap hairspray or a fine, um, more uh, art historical spray, um, then it will fall apart just like charcoal would over a surface uh, when it's exposed. But what's great about this, especially with the deeper areas or the, the darker areas, 
and I can apply another layer on this, is that I started to experiment, change the spray to a stream where it can dissipate. And then I let that dry and it creates some very interesting um, areas. And in the past where I was letting the paint drip, this was allowing for uh, pools of medium to collect and then dry. And with this, you can you know, go even further and be able to create you know, a variety of different patterns. And then once it's dry, then you can start refining edges or continue using some of the hand-drawn materials. But I wanted to keep it to its basics of materials so that it was really true to the essence of, you know, the reflection of my heritage and, and memories. So this has been an ongoing process and I'm finding new ideas from using these materials and hopefully come up with a, new, a brand new series with some of these techniques. Something that I didn't show yet, and that is using the acrylic inks, which I've used in at least two or three of these compositions. And with the wood burning, it's been, go back to this piece. And I can either add directly on to the surface or brush it on. And just like I was using that was acrylic paint, the acrylic inks can dissolve a little bit and still maintain its color. It's so almost like watered down acrylics, but I've noticed, you know, some nuances with the acrylic inks that has been great to work with. And these are things you can find at a craft store. Higgins has been a pretty popular ink by far, but then, you know, there's just do a little bit of uh, shopping and you can find some, a nice variety of different colors. So that is basically the process of some of these materials. Anytime I'm painting with acrylics, it's pretty straightforward. However, it has been a lot of different layers. And Ali, if you would like, we can switch over to the laptop view and then I can explain what I've just shown on right. some of the examples that I have. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. okay. All right, so I do have some of the larger pieces and you will see a couple of these in their original orientation. Where on the left, you'll see the, the inks and the layering that was involved with that. Hey, Fab. Hey, quick question for you. Yes. What would happen if you use pencil in place of charcoal? Pencil instead of charcoal? Yeah. I have, <laughs> but I feel like the charcoal is leaving a better impression something residual to you know, the wood burning. The pencil just feels as though that is a sketching tool and it's creating part of the outline. Uh -huh. But it, to me, it doesn't, it, it's not as impactful uh, as the charcoal. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So with this, 
I'll wheel it closer to you. You can see that there is you know, quite a few layers. With the acrylic inks, they are similar to watercolors. So if let's say you accidentally drop some water on top, it'll start to be and separate the ink from the surface. So you have to be careful. Or use it to your favor and then go start to, you know, blend it in. But actually you can tell that there is some sketch lines you can pencil. And so that's exactly what I use to help sketch out all these compositions onto each of the of the compositions, onto the, the boards. Here is what I was just showing you with the charcoal technique. And as you can see, there's, there's quite a few different applications of the charcoal wash. And this was using this tool or piece of wood as a tool. And there are some faint pencil lines, but then I would reinforce them with this homey charcoal. And then in some cases we use fine lines with a brush of the charcoal wash that I was showing you and then reinforcing some of those lines. So it's been a nice, there are some, you know, um, different international influences of the ink and the water on the surface, in particular with a lighter background. But again, we're looking at this in its original format, which is now being displayed as something horizontal. What I really want to show is a couple more pieces where we see this one, if not my most favorite, is probably one of them. And it has a lot of different layers and applications of this wood burning. So I'm trying to get as close as I can for you to be able to see all of these different patterns. This it's a fun watching paint dry, slow process, um, but persistence is key. And where you can see you know, there's a little bit of shine, but there's in many cases reinforcing over the same areas or going very slow. And the slower you go, the darker it gets. And just again, different techniques for different areas. I'm trying to show how you can see a variety of areas juxtaposed with each other. And then little bright pops of color in the space of the light blue, a celeste in Spanish, which is one of the colors of uh, the Argentine flag. So we'll zoom out again. There is a little bit of paint in here as a stain with the brown areas. And that was using some of the acrylic inks, the brownish color. What I like about it too is that it's not completely painted. There is exposed wood. And I think that's fine where we have seen artists that would use or unprimed canvases or use a clear gesso so that you see the texture of the canvas come through. I'm trying to do the same with these pieces and I'll frame them myself you know, with the construction, which will be wired and ready to hang. But this has been a, a construction that I, I've done for many of the, the artworks on Wizards. And it's great because then you can just paint the sides. This one's a little over two inches thick or deep and creates a nice finish and then it's ready to hang. 
They can also be framed, but this basically works as uh, a structural and framing um, device. Let me ask you a question real quick, Fab. Um, yeah. I, uh, I also didn't notice this, um, but did you talk about how exactly you make these circles? Like, do you use like a string and a pencil or do you use... Uh... Good question. I eventually, they work on several pieces of the paper taped together. But I found that it helps when you have something where it's clear with sheets of tracing paper. And these have all of the lines. It needs to be two of these. Uh, larger taped together sheets where you would see the shape of Argentina with one set and then the concentric circles with the other. And I'll show you a piece that is more skeleton and you kind of see that with the black and white. But it's a similar structure to something like this. And then that's superimposed over but I wanted to uh, maybe use this as the example as far as Argentina. Let's see if I can start right here. This is basically the shape of Argentina for one. And then if you can see the other one is upside down on the other side. So they're basically rotated 180 degrees from each other. It's probably a little bit more clear with this one. So you can see it in the top here. And then again, upside down on the other side. So Fab, out of curiosity, um, what you're saying, what you do to get these shapes onto the uh, surface is almost like a, a Renaissance style cartoon where you're tracing on tracing paper, flipping it 180, tracing the back to transfer the graphite over to the surface. Is that what you're doing? Yeah, so transferring it is more like carbon paper. For those that remember how we used to do credit card receipts. Gotcha. Yeah, and getting a receipt and you'd have to sign it. This is placed over the surface of the board and then the design placed over. And for those that are not familiar with the way that the transfer paper works, is that anytime you make a mark over the transfer paper, it will leave a mark on the surface. So if I do this right now, you can see it right there. So then that allows for you to be able to use a pencil right over the lines of the clear tracing paper with this sandwich in between and it leaves the mark onto the board. And so by having that clear sheet that I showed you, it's consistent with each board. And so that stays consistent, but I was trying to show that deterioration of opacity and vibrant color to that monochrome black and white that I just showed you. So that is using the boards. I do have some of the other ones that I did on canvas, in particular, 14 colors tall. And I do want to point this out because there's, to me, there is a fascination with being able to paint over or adding more layers to the same painting 
over and over again. This started off, I don't know the orientation anymore, but let's just say it's this way. It was a portrait of Carlos Gardel, a tango singer, very popular in the mid um, century of last, you know, the last century, so 1940s and 50s, uh, was sort of the, the godfather of tango singers. And so it was a portrait and it had gaucho, or sorry, tango steps as sort of a foot diagram. Here you put your feet here and then move them here and then the next step. And it was superimposed on top. Well, that started to fade off and turn into, and in fact, there's actually a footstep in here somewhere. But for the most part, it was a lot of this staccato type movement of brushwork with the pink and the black and the white as the underlay. Well, this then turned into the backdrop to this abstract landscape, these mountain ranges uh, of an Argentine peak. And I was really getting into using uh, paint pens as well as paint brushes with fine tips and reinforce certain lines, adding gradations, uh, some texture, but a lot of that texture was already in here. And it was just a matter of toning some of that down to create either, you know, the sky as a backdrop or almost like a pool or a shadow of something uh, almost flat as again, like part of a facade. Others. I've used that as reference to something that is a little bit more recent. This goes back to Canvas. And so I feel like it's healthy to be able to go back and forth between a canvas and a board and just seeing what comes out of the process. The subject matter might change, but the abstraction and the style, I feel like it resonates with each of these pieces. So it's hard to tell where this is leading as far as you know the next theories, but I feel like it's beginning a new chapter um, you know, between these boards, the wood burning, and then the multiple applications of, of different materials that I've shown you. And that is a lot, but pretty much it as far as the demonstration. All right. Um, well, if anybody has any questions, um, oh, do you varnish these, Fab? What's that? You hear me? Do you, what, what do you use to finish these when you're done? That's the first question we have for you. What do I use to, I'm sorry? Uh, to finish them, do you use a, like a polyurethane or a varnish when you finish? So the black and white, this one right here. It, there's been a story because sometimes you get a little overzealous and you are overconfident and you feel like, oh, this is going to be permanent and it'll stay forever. Mm -hmm. And over time, as it dries and you run your hand across it, it just completely crumbles or dissipates. So you can get this at Jerry's Artorama. I feel like I'm in a commercial Dega fixative. Mm -hmm. And it's a little bit more expensive than, say, crystal clear. Mm -hmm. But it allows, it's odor free, it's non toxic, and it allows to bind a lot of that material onto the surface and keep it archived. But uh -huh. I've also been told that cheap 
um, Dollar Tree hairspray can also work as well. Yeah, it does. <laughs> so yeah, and I think a lot of us use that in general for like drawings on on paper. Yeah, Aquanet. Um, yeah. Have you ever uh, actually uh, tried using the wood burning tool on a pre gesso surface or with acrylic paint? Good question. It's not ideal. No. Uh, but it also depends on how thin of the surface. In fact, I think I still have the tool on. It's not that there's anything, you know, toxic about it. But it does leave some residue. So you can see there. And it may involve a little bit of sanding, but it can create a different effect. It's like basically carving through what you've added as far as your primer or paint. But especially with, this is the using kills as a primer. Mm -hmm. So it may not smell as much when you burn acrylics. So uh, it, depending on how thick the paint can be, uh, use of the wood burning tool may not be the most ideal. If it's like what I had here, what I used as the demo, I can go through the surface because it's fairly thin. And so you can still see both the paint and the mark made. And so I can go back and forth with these. And here, there is some paint in here. And then I'm able to reinforce that line again. Mm -hmm. So thin layers would be best to do that. All right. So I guess, I don't know, um, I've seen your work change style quite a bit over the past like 10, 15 years or so. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about the evolution of your style, how you arrived at the current kind of almost cubist perspective on vibrant colors that you're kind of using in your more current work? Sure, um, good question. So it used to be very representational as you saw with those portraits and with the Pentagonia series and the pop series. I think it was, it was seeing and observing other artists using abstraction that pulled me in to help me interpret the abstraction on my own. And that allowed me to you know, broaden the horizon and use that creative imagination to allow others to be able to use theirs and try to interpret that same work. And it's a little different in terms of the expectation. When mm -hmm. I'm using the shape of Argentina on those pieces, it's not obvious until I point it out. Mm -hmm. And what I've seen is there it seems to be some great dialogue when explaining some of the work to an audience when dealing with more abstraction. Something more representational, there it is. You have a bowl of fruit, you have a portrait, you have a landscape. And then how the medium was used or applied, or maybe there's a story to, let's say, a scene in a living room and the person or the furniture or something, it recalled some memories. So it it has some personal history to it. Whereas mm -hmm. with the abstraction, the viewer sees something, and especially with a show or an artist that they're not familiar with, and then they approach it, there's like a different perspective in terms of proximity. And then when you are engaging in dialogue with the artist, there can be some, aha, oh, I didn't know that, or you know, I didn't realize. And so then it, it feels like it engages in conversations even further. Mm -hmm. So because of that, 
I think it allowed to have um, some different creativity going on, and especially with using a series. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's uh, more possibilities, like with this current series that I've been working on, where it can go in a number of different ways. Mm -hmm. And working in a series is not easy. But with the abstraction, once you start taking a path and really explore those different options to help make them cohesive, um, I think it's more rewarding. So mm -hmm. I think that's those have been the main reasons for uh, switching to and continuing with abstract work. Mm -hmm. So even though the work you're doing now is abstract, I mean, it's still definitely like pulling from, you know, kind of ideas about memory, um, identity, and the kind of like the cultural blend of North American and kind of Latin American culture. Um, how do you approach translating kind of those things? Like how, like, can you expand on that a little bit? On the memory and identity, yes. Yeah. And There's the blending being, of both cultures, I suppose, too, because I feel like that's a huge, such a big part of your work. Right. Well, it recalls the memories of growing up where I never lived in Argentina, would <laughs> only visit. And, you know, once we got older or in college, they were basically the ending the trips. And I only have three other relatives in my family, in my immediate family here in the United States and everyone else is in Argentina. Mm -hmm. um, so those memories are basically what identified as Argentine for me. Mm -hmm. And using a camera as I grew up was the device. It was the memory collector. And that's all I had. Mm -hmm. And therefore it created this ongoing dilemma of identifying in terms of proximity with mm -hmm. the Latino, Latino heritage. Mm -hmm. And as that was what fascinated me with this series or coming up with it in terms of the memory fading. Mm -hmm. And therefore it's like the Latino identity is, is fading a little bit. Mm -hmm. So where there are maybe a lot of family members or people going to their country of heritage a little bit more frequently than they feel more connected. Mm -hmm. And we do have certain Hispanic populations of different countries in the triangle. Uh, and so that helps them connect. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily have that. And it's where I hold on to the art. And in a way it is sort of a memoriam mm -hmm. of those mem memories as well as the identity. But it is the retracing with each piece that helps kind of reinforce the Latino identity at the same time. So it's this interesting mix of losing and gaining. At and the is same the time. circle, is the use of the circle symbolic in that sense? Basically. Okay. Yeah. And okay. the way that it's kind of rotating mm -hmm. and having a central area as the, I mean, almost dead center with each of those boards, mm -hmm. that is basically the core of being a hybrid. Mm -hmm. And where the pieces that I've done in the past was, you know, the, the Marlboro Man mm -hmm. of North America versus the Gaucho of Argentina. Mm -hmm. And so it was always this play of what I remember uh, seeing with my visits versus what I would experience on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a little bit about materials. So why don't you talk a little bit about what kind of wood you're using? The wood that I use. And what kind of wood is acceptable to use for this? Good question. First of all, it's trial and error. Um, but the underlayment, uh, the underlayer, these are $20 
for a sheet of four by four, which is barely nothing. You just get that at a hardware store? Lowe's or Home Depot. Right yep. Where you can find, you know, the sheets of wood, not the four by eight feet, which can, you know, go up to just under a hundred dollars. Um, these are fairly lightweight and use, it's a triply. So it's a, a triple layer and basically like, you know, um, thin sandwich board. And they do come up with a variety as I showed with this one having a smoother surface and it's a little bit more rigid. Um, for anybody that has done Taekwondo where there's these breakboards, this is pretty much like a breakboard and it can snap pretty easily if I were to you know, actually put pressure on this. But it's great and lightweight enough that you can apply heat and you can get a mark pretty quickly. So it's this cedar poplar blend that I seem to gravitate towards because you can easily burn. Now, I think I saw a, a question pop up, like what kind of wood burning tool do mm -hmm. I use? Yeah, it was next. Gotcha. <laughs> this is about between 20 and $30. And what's great about this is that you have, they come with, different tips that you know you are going to use a um, tweezer or plier oh can you talk a little bit closer to the computer again i'm sorry it's hard to hear you now can you hear me there you go okay so i'm going to take this one off and then you can put in a new tip if I put this on here, we'll leave a mark. Let's say I'm going to use a, and again, you want to make sure that it's either off or with the, the pliers. And the thing about the, this, hold that tool up to the, yeah, the camera. Yeah. You have to let it heat out a little bit. But what's great about this tool is that it looks like a, a, a spade and it allows to do some interesting marks on a broader scale or with the tip. And it's like starting, just barely starting to, it's like toast on like a, a very light level. Or light burn, but if I let this burn a little bit, you can see where it's creating, you know, creating to be something radial, or you know, you're using it to kind of bore on the surface and do like hatch marks or or what have you. So. This, for some reason, your demo is not being, you get to switch cameras real quick because it's switched on my end, but I guess on everyone else's end, they can only see your shoulder. Keep well, I'll just leave it on. Okay, cool. This is the, the camera. So now that we have, so this is one of the tools. And I will say that there are other tools out there. And this, I was starting to roll earlier. And while this is a little bit more expensive, this is a different kind of, of burning and it's a coil tip. And it uses a screwdriver to unscrew these. And it basically can really put a lot of heat. The problem that maybe it's too much heat. And it, it basically was starting to burn and you can actually see a little bit of gray there is the, the plastic was burning. So uh, even with the safe setting and they're saying, keep it under 60, whatever the level is, it was still burning. So maybe I have a dud, I don't know, but I basically looked it up online on Amazon and then purchased it. What is the specific brand of wood burner that you use? 
uh, the specific what? I'm sorry. The specific brand of wood burner that you prefer. This doesn't really. It's not so much of a brand, but the type. Ah. And so this is fairly reliable to be able to use. It. I mean, as long as you've got, you know, you can plug it in and tweezers. And if you feel like you're not going to have any heat transfer to the handle. Mm -hmm. This, on the other hand, you can actually feel the heat. And I had to wear a glove with this. So that was probably warning sign number one. It was just getting too hot. Mm -hmm. But these right here, I don't even know the brand because I, I got this like over 15 years ago. Okay. And it's still kind of a tried and true method. But if anyone knows of any other brands of these coil burners, I'm all ears. All right. Um, so let me think of some more questions. All right. So your background, um, you studied both painting as well as graphic design. How do these two disciplines influence each other in your creative process? Very good question. Actually, that's a good reminder. Uh, when I was advertising for the class or for the demo, I was saying, how do you juggle between uh -huh. graphic design and sort of an art career? Juggling between the two, they feed off of each other, but they're sort of a respite from each other. Mm -hmm. The nine to five, really eight to five, is the graphic design. And it's constantly ongoing because the graphics within a corporate environment are still keeping me on my toes because it's not just one project. You're working on multiple requests or projects on any given day. So that is part of the motivation, but it's being able to switch off and then come into this oven of a garage called my studio. And I luckily have a fan, but it helps me loosen up a little bit and this is my sandbox and so then mm -hmm. i can i may be thinking of ideas and i'll write them down on to a sketchbook or a notepad while i'm working so i have something fresh to be able to take with me as far as an idea or a sketch to work on another painting or an existing painting so Having the two has been ideal. I would think that if you were working a non-creative job and still, it still allows you to be thinking about how you can use your creativity within your art mm -hmm. and what's helped as well is going to art shows, going to museums like the Museum of Art, and engaging in conversations. So it's not just looking on an Instagram feed, which I also look at as well for inspiration, but going to these places in person helps tremendously. So you don't get sapped out of energy and no creativity. So it's, it's this nice blend and it definitely keeps me busy. Yeah, so I was wondering, um, so yeah, I was wondering if you could also add something about how like showing in Raleigh and essentially participating in the like triangle community art scene. I wonder if you could touch on some of those experiences and how they've kind of contributed to your growth of an artist, especially in terms of, I guess, being able to engage like a kind of diverse audiences. As a, I think it works both as a participant, mm -hmm. like an audience member, as well as the creator, the presenter. Mm -hmm. And staying engaged by, like last year especially, I think it was about between 25 and 30 shows that I was a part of. In many cases, it was a group environment, but I was trying everything and using everything but the kitchen sink. Mm -hmm. And 
it definitely kept me busy and the amount of gas that I used between Raleigh, Durham, Carborough, Hillsborough was, it was definitely worth it. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about all those concentric circles in my work, it's also a representation of how all these overlapping social circles happen. Mm -hmm. You'll start seeing some people from Durham to Raleigh, you know, to different areas because they engage. They're active participants. They work and they teach and even speak about their art mm -hmm. during presentations or talks. And the more you feed off of that, the more momentum you have. And that's what's been great for me is that I just started getting used to getting into all these shows to where now people are asking for putting a, a piece or, mm -hmm. you know, creating something for the sake of an event. And it's a good problem to have, but it has definitely kept me busy, <laughs> but it's been all worth it. Um, yeah, there's, so there's a comment in the chat that someone says uh, that your work reminds them of, uh, and I completely agree with this, uh, Russian constructed constructivist work from the 20s and Bauhaus and kind of like we were talking about I was saying it reminds me of kind of Italian futurism as well and cubism obviously um I wonder if you could speak to these like art historical references that you pull from for your work is that um sure yeah is that like a kind like yeah go ahead. um I think since I went to NC State uh dating myself back in uh early 90s mm -hmm. and loved just even going through the school of design, the buildings there and the library and just engaging with some of the students. Even my roommate was mm -hmm. at the time an architecture student and really was drawn to Le Corbusier, the architecture, as well as my dad had a Picasso magazine or book, I forget, where I was really exploring some of that abstraction. But it was really this, you know, Baccioni, Duchamp, mm -hmm. you know, the futurism, even Delaunay, and a couple of, you know, Kandinsky, mm -hmm. having all these interesting shapes and angles and, you know, just in the abstract world. And Roberto Mata, mm -hmm. a Chilean surrealist, his work just expanded, you know, the, the universal scale. His work dealt with, you know, a, a cosmic interpretation of the world or the universe. Mm -hmm. A lot of space and depth involved, geometric planes. So then it was really exploring, you know, different countries, especially within the Bauhaus movement. And futurism definitely, cubism, it felt like everyone knows about cubism mm -hmm. and understanding that, oh, that's a portrait and there's a profile as well as a three-quarter pose and all these different angles and shapes. But with futurism, it felt like you were also mixing the element of time. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so things seemed like more open and possible to procedural type of approaches. And that's mm -hmm. what really drew me into those movements, as someone pointed, within the Bauhaus and interpreted that into my work recently. Mm -hmm. I think, um, like, I think kind of what always drew me to your work is kind of this, like, combination of abstraction, but then there's, like, kind of your personal experience and then this, like, broader cultural dialogue that happens within your work. Um, do you have any advice for other artists, like, on how to kind of effectively channel that personal narrative into what you would think of as universally kind of relatable artwork? Just a tough question, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Very deep. Yeah. Uh, within 
I mean, this could be open to the Latino sense or just basically in general. Yeah. I think, well, I'll, I'll speak on a personal level with the Latino identity. What's great is that there are certain communities within whatever theme, subject matter, or, you know, basically theory of relativity. Mm -hmm. And for the Latino artists in the triangle, you're going to have different approaches. But what's great is, you know, one can be working fabric. Another with ceramics or natural materials and creating their own mediums. Others that are, you know, working with abstract or representation. And because Latin America is so vast, it allows me to expand my horizons or perspectives on my heritage is from one country, Argentina. Mm -hmm. Before that, my descendants from Italy. Mm -hmm. But then I hear more and more, what's great is that I'm understanding more of the Mexican culture, the Honduran culture, the Colombian culture, Brazilian, through their art. Mm -hmm. So it has a double meaning for me. And what's great is that there are so many opportunities in the triangle with different organizations that, that allow you to be able to sometimes just, you know, coincidentally being from the same heritage in the same mm -hmm. classroom or in the same mm -hmm. environment. Mm -hmm. But it's, as they say, artists come from other artists. And to be able to, uh, and, and I agree with the comment just made, um, and I'll get to that. It's where I can never say that I'm just Argentine. Mm -hmm. I am Latino because I, you know, back to what I was saying with my identity as a Latino, mm -hmm. it fades when I think just Argentine, but it feels more connected when I'm associated with and connecting with other members of the Latino population in the tribe. Mm -hmm. But that applies to any common theme. You may, you know, enjoy abstraction or comical art, but there's always an audience. You just mm -hmm. have to look for them. And there's critiques too, I think, with like Durham Arts Council, with the Museum of Art and other venues, so. Yeah, there's stuff all over the community for sure. Yeah. Oh. There was a, a comment made and I'll agree. Argentina is probably the most European country in South America. The joke is, how do you shut an Argentine up? Tie his hands. Because we're always talking <laughs> very Italian. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I must confess, I don't know that much about Argentina, obviously. But, uh, no, it's a, uh, I have to take your word for it that it's super European. Um, I mean, we could, I could be just talking and, and you're on mute and it's like, why is he arguing? He looks mad. What's going on? And that's just the way we talk. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, does, I, I don't have any more questions. Does anyone else have any more questions before we uh, wrap this up? Oh, oh, and what do you think about Borges, the author? Borges, sure. yeah. one of my favorite writers. is is amazing. And Martin Fierro is very... Uh, while it's not Borges, is uh, you know the legend for me as it's the legend of the gaucho. But there's so many poems um, and literature by Borges and uh, a bunch of other uh, Latin authors and writers. But yeah, love Borges. It's one thing I do know about Argentina: the writing of Borges. <laughs> yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, well, I think that um, will pretty much conclude uh, today's presentation, and we're about at time anyhow. Uh, thank you guys for bearing with um, this through all of our technical problems, and um, hopefully by next month when we're back, we'll have all of that worked out on our side here at NCMA, so I apologize for that, um, and I hope to see you guys all in the future. Um,
Thanks for attending, everyone.